It is time to go ahead and begin. And uh, one logistical announcement that Paul Hickbert reminded me of that's an excellent announcement to make. The proceedings for this conference you all received on the USB sticks, but they're now publicly released and available because we're in the middle of the conference. So the URL that you can send your friends to, and I bet somebody's going to tweet this right now, is gigapixelscience.gigapan.org. So gigapixelscience.gigapan.org goes straight to links to all the papers in PDF form and links into the uh, gigapans that are referenced by them. It is a great pleasure to introduce the invited talk that we have before lunch. And uh, the person I'm introducing is a fine fellow. We had the pleasure of interacting with him in a prior fine workshop, and we had the pleasure of listening to him speak. And the, um, the things that he said were so close to our heart that we felt uh, it necessary to find the biggest possible audience with which to share him. And so uh, I'm going to be introducing Jim Richardson. So let me do that now. Jim is a photographer for the National Geographic magazine and a contributing editor of its sister publication, Traveler magazine. Uh, Jim has photographed more than 25 stories for National Geographic, most recently Our Good Earth and The Death of the Night. His work takes him around the world, from the tops of volcanic peaks to below the surface of swamps and wetlands. ABC News Nightline produced a story about the long process of assembling a National Geographic coverage by following Richardson in the field and at National Geographic Society headquarters in Washington, D.C. Please join me in warmly welcoming Jim Richardson. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me back. I, gee, I did something wrong last year or I'd be home in bed at this hour. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be back. It really is. And uh, gee, I, I haven't had this many colors on, the, on my thing, you know, for, I'm looking for, come back next year and be Grand Poobah or some such thing as like that, you know. So anyway, it's, it's, it's fun to be back amongst uh, scientists. Yesterday I was speaking to about 4,000 uh, high school journalism students. So I spent most of my time talking about Facebook and the new generation of things like that. So, so uh, I'll, I'll talk about other things uh, today. And um, as, as way of, a way of background, yes, I've done about 25 stories for National Geographic magazine over the last 25 years. I actually had hair when I started working for National Geographic. I wore bell-bottom pants, you know, and two-tone blue and cream two-tone shoes back in that area. And I, it's, God, you, you didn't want to know me. Um, and over that time, I've done a lot of stories about a lot of, a lot of subjects, some of them cultural, but a lot, a lot of issue stories and a lot of, of uh, scientific stories. And uh, so, so it always comes down to the application of photography, because you start with a story, and then you adapt the photography to the story that needs telling, and you go looking for images that, that carry that visual narrative forward. So um, I thought I would begin today, though, with what I always enjoy, uh, and enjoyed particularly when I was a psychology major uh, back uh, in college until I figured out one day what it was that psychologists did every day. And then I went and got a job with a student newspaper. That was my uh, transition into photography. And, but there, I, I loved you know, the well-crafted, clever study. And this was a clever study. You know? It was about vision. And I think I read this in Gregory's book, Eye, uh, Eye and the Brain. And it was this. It had to do with how our brain forms images. What, how do we see things? And, you know, we're, we're long past the idea that the, uh, you know, the image is coming into your eye and, uh, and then it's being transmitted back to the brain and there's a little man back there watching the, the little movie screen inside your head sort of thing, you know. We know that we take this information and we create an image which we project onto the world. And how we do that how we make those decisions, how we build that image that we project onto the world, you know, is f rife with problems. I mean, we sit here and we think we see this whole room in detail when in fact, you know, we can only really see, you know, the, the fovea in the eye can only really see detail about the size of that. Yet we build this image and we believe we can see all this all around us in detail all the time. And we can't. So here was the study, and it was very clever, I thought. It was that they had some film of a tennis ball 
being hit and it's coming down and it's going to hit on the tennis court and bounce. And it's going to hit very near the foul line. You can't tell for sure if it's hitting on the foul line, inside, or outside. And so they have a bunch of people look at this film and just about 50-50 say, yep, it bounced fair, it hit on the line, and then about 50% of the people said, no, it didn't, I saw it. And I saw it hit, I definitely saw it hit beyond the line. Some of them said they could actually see the ball compress when it hit, so they knew they'd actually seen it. Now here's the problem, it was film, okay? And so here's a frame, ball in the air, another frame, ball in the air, another frame, ball in the air, another frame, the ball is already hit and it's bounced beyond. There was no frame of the ball on the ground. There was no way of determining from the film whether or not it had hit fair or foul. And yet these people who were looking at this had seen it. Their brain had created the image from their experience with balls bouncing from the earliest days of their youth. They had created this image of the ball hitting on the ground and they had seen it. Now, this is not an illusion. This is the way we see things. We create images and we project them on the world. And what we believe determines a great deal of what we see. So those folks, as much as we see anything, as much as you see me here, as much as I see you there, they had seen the ball hit. Now, the interesting thing about that is that with the same evidence, different people had seen different things. That's a, that's a tough one to get your head around, you know. But it is fundamental to understanding photographs then, because photographs are the same kind of illusion. It's not a mountain out there. It is a piece of paper with some graphics on it. And we project what we know from experience, from what we can see, from all these kinds of things, that this is actually a mountain very far away. Now, photographers play with that all the time. We put things in the foreground to make you believe that the mountain is actually farther away. If it's actually farther away, then you think it's bigger. So I play those games all the time in my photography, trying to make you see what I saw. But it's also to make you believe what I believed. There is that piece of it as well. So in images, there is always a bit of this whole business that we need to be a little careful about what we believe because we can see what we believe is there. And in, and in fact, that is not a distortion of the human vision process. It's part and parcel of how it works. So with that in mind, let's, uh, let's move on to some things that I wanted to show you here. There we go. A little bit about vision, science, and communications. This is uh, at Karnak Temple, by the way, and it is a perfect, to me, example of the way in which uh, a panoramic image, a gigapan, this wasn't on a gigapan, this was me holding my camera very quickly because if you set up a tripod in there, they'll be after you. Um, but the way that those columns, in any single image, even with the widest angle lens, you never get this effect. You never get this effect of looking down one row of columns, down another row of columns, and down another row of columns as you rotate within them. It is a tremendous way of bringing something like that to life. And so I want to talk about a couple of things about using images now, because that's what I end up doing for National Geographic, using images in the service of a narrative. So when you think about images, one of the things to remember also is that images generally are more connected with the emotional side of the brain. Words are generally more connected with the rational, reasonable side of the brain. The problem is that the, 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 the image side, the emotional side, is much bigger. There are a lot more cells in your brain going into vision and all those kind of things than there are on the other, other side. The effect of that tends to be, and, and this, is, this is tied in with one other effect I'll mention, first beliefs are very powerful. In fact, there have been some nice, clever studies 
showing that once people have been made to believe something, it's very difficult to make them unbelieve it. Even if you tell them in advance that what you're going to tell them is untrue, they will tend to believe it. It's a, it's a, it's a pathological part of our human being, but it is, it is definitely true. And once you convince them with a picture, you have convinced them with one of the most powerful things you can convince them with. The effect of that generally ends up being that if you, it's very difficult to argue with a picture using words. About the only effective way to argue with a picture is with another picture. And you want to be very careful the first image that you present because that one is going to be so formative. Another effect that I want to mention is, you know how you read a scientific paper. You start at the abstract, right? And, and, and then you may go to the conclusions and you may go back in there. The images in scientific papers are always buried back in the middle, right? I'm in the primary image business. I want to bring those images up to the front. I want to, in a sense, in, our, in a National Geographic story, which of course is not a scientific paper, even though we for a long time wanted to pretend they were, um, I want to bring those images up into the front of it, into the abstract. I want to, to bring them up there because both they are so convincing and they have so much impact. And in our modern media world, the business of having impact, of bringing people into the fold, of making them understand what we're about is vastly important. I mentioned to the kids yesterday that uh, I have, I've been experimenting in the last year on Flickr. Flickr now has something over four billion images on it. And the interesting thing about that is that any time you go onto Flickr and you see how many images were uploaded in the last minute, it's always somewhere between six and 8,000. Six and 8,000 images uploaded in the last minute. So the flow, that's a great barometer of the flow of information in our world. Visual information now, in some cases, overpowering written information but a huge, vast flow of this stuff. As I mentioned, we at National Geographic, we're in the visual narrative business. Now, I don't want to say picture stories or storytelling, but it is visual narrative, and we spend a vast amount of time and effort trying to get that narrative right. For the current story that I'm working on, I'll show you something in a bit here, I am up over 40,000 frames now on that one story. 40,000 that will come down to probably 20 to 25 images in the story. And we will parse and go over that any number of times trying to get that narrative right. Uh, but pictures take that sort of effort to make them happen. And then finally, images by intention. I mean, very often I, I know what you, you essentially do in a scientific paper is you have images there to, as carrying information, and you have images that are basically demonstrating that what is written in the paper is actually true. In other words, verification of what you, what you have written. We are doing images by intention, starting, starting with a story. Not that we're not going to correct it mid-course if we find something wrong, but very much by intention. So I'm going to show you a bunch of images here about going out and looking looking for images for very specific purposes. I shot this last Tuesday, I think in Ethiopia, a woman mixing injera from teff flower, a, 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 a grain grown not exclusively in Ethiopia, but this, the, the country where it's terribly, terribly important. So I was very glad to find that little scene. So yes, by the way, uh, yes, I, I do have a very rough life you know, traveling around the world. Uh, and I just wanted to share with you a few things about how terribly difficult it is being a National Geographic photographer and the things you have to put up with every day. You know, it's a, it's a rough, rough world. I, I made sure I had uh, both the guys and the girls in here for, you know, to be uh, equal opportunity for everybody in the audience. This is out on Easter Island, and it's a great thing. So you might find me on the Royal Scotsman dressed up in a kilt uh, doing a story, a travel story on this luxury train. But you're more likely to find me back at my home in Kansas, there on Main Street in Lindsborg, uh, where we have a gallery, and I hope you will come visit us if you ever get, get through there. Or uh, up on a, uh, 
roof of a barn with uh, 50 other flooded pigs. Uh, I mean, did I say that right? Let me see. Uh, 50 pigs and me. I should have said something like that. Um, during the 1993 flood, or uh, eating live termites there in a market in Kenya. So yes, it's, 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 it's vastly interesting. It's a great exploration of the world, and I enjoy uh, every minute of it. One of those things that I just came back from, one of the things I've just I've told Hila that I was running from was that I just finished a trip around the world by private jet with National Geographic, which included uh, stops in Machu Picchu up in Peru where I did this panorama. I had never seen, I don't know why, I had never seen anybody do a panorama from up there. You always get this Hiram Bingham view that he shot in 1911 that everybody shot every time since. But you can stand in the same place and there are mountains all around. How many people have, you, some of you been to Machu Picchu? Yeah, glorious place, right? But there's mountains all around. You never see the pictures of all this all around you. That is a great effect of that. On to Easter Island where we went out to the Moai. This is the uh, Southern Milky Way there, uh, Magellanic Cloud in the upper right hand corner under that. By the way, it's only been what? Three or four years since we've had consumer grade or professional grade uh, cameras that could do this. This is a 90 second shot, uh, F2.8 at ISO 6400, which allows you, with a 14 millimeter lens, that's another part of the thing, it allows you to do a straight shot, essentially. There's a guy over there with a flashlight lighting up the Moai uh, off on the side, but a straight shot, in other words, not having to sandwich the pictures together. National Geographic, we can't sandwich them together. It's just part of the part of the deal, staying honest with our readers. From Easter Island, we went on to Samoa, where we had a, a kava ceremony, on to Cambodia, uh, to Prom Temple here, uh, that, you know, uh, Laura Croft Tomb Raiders, uh, you know, temple. This is, this is the great place with all the, the trees growing down over the walls. Um, this is an interesting example of uh, the uh, the uh, technology of, of panoramas to me because basically what I had to do is I had to stand up there with my 16 millimeter lens. There is a platform down on the ground, which was getting in the way, and stand up there and hold this thing up above my head in order to do a series of shots around this way and thereby cut out the platform. But I'm close enough then that you see that the, the two walls that are at right angles like this have each one bowed towards me uh, but I've never seen uh, an image like that. The panoramas, uh, when you get into places like Bayonne Temple, are just priceless because they, they are all so close in. There are so many things that are approximate around you that you can't get back and have the experience that you have of standing in the middle of it and looking off uh, at one alleyway over there and seeing one temple over there and seeing something else on the other side. We have in photography these icons, just like Machu Picchu, the Taj Mahal is one of those, those things. And so as many times as you see this picture, and this is an iconic, cliched image of uh, Taj, the Taj Mahal, you never get a sense. You can read about it, but you get very few, very little sense until you see it this way and realize that it's on a very great platform with a mosque offer on each side uh, and as you notice there, you see what's going on, that, that shadow falling from that, that minaret there, go, then wraps around to the right over towards the, the temple over on the right side. Now, if you get into that business of looking at those bricks in the foreground too closely, you're going to find the places where, you know, it was, uh, there are some hocus pocus going on in the software, but the effect is great. Oh, uh, we had to stay at the Romba Palace. Boy, it's about like Motel 6, I said. This was, my, uh, this was my tent, my walled tent in safari camp down in, uh, in the Serengeti. And just below that tent in the river, there were 200 uh, hippos down there in the morning. So it was a, it was a glorious place to be. On, then, uh, on the same trip to the Sphinx and the pyramids in Giza, and, and once again, you know, when you could get the people out of the foreground, all of a sudden, you could do a, a, a panoramic image here, which really is very tough to do. Even with a 14 millimeter lens last year, I was never able to get this sort of sweeping effect of the pyramids and that. 
on to that night to our uh, grand uh, finale dinner at uh, Luxor Temple. That was tough, I tell you. And then into uh, Marrakesh, to the Kasbah, which is uh, just uh, the, the souk, I should say, which is a great myriad warren of, of uh, marketing and uh, little alleyways going every which way, but for which the idea of, again, just like in the temples in Cambodia, being able to pan and see down all these things was just absolutely uh, priceless. And then uh, our last night at La Mamunya in Marrakesh. Boy, I tell you, that's a tough hotel to have to stay in. So, the experience, though, of going out on some of these stories, and what I want to do now is, is to just give you some idea of the, the range of stories that we, would, we I might do and how we think about the images going into it and how they develop out of it because it's, it's always a, it's a give and take. So several years ago, I had proposed a story on the Hebrides Islands, one of our landscape series. And basically, these stories have the intent of bringing a landscape to people who may not have otherwise thought about it. In other words, it's not that the Hebrides are unknown, but that many of our readers have fallen off the radar. And one of the great beliefs that I have and the magazine has is that we will not save what we do not cherish. So we have a very specific ax to grind doing this. Uh, I'm going to go out and I'm going to try and take glorious pictures, but I'm also going to do explanatory pictures, pictures that somehow bring something to life that has been seen before. Well, one of the great places to go there is up to the store, the old uh, Mana store up on Sky, where you see the largest landslip in the British Isles. You know, and that thing is really magnificent. Beyond this, the, uh, the, the remaining crags sticking up there, you can actually see the slope of that great landslip that came off that cliff and uh, pushed out towards the island of Reyse over on the left. Down on the far end down there, you can see the, the soft rounded shapes of the black coolins and then the hard craggy shapes of the uh, red coolins there on the right side. Of course, the colony stones are always wonderful, but they were also wonderful in this because that's Luesian gneiss. Luesian gneiss, some of the oldest uh, rock on the face of the earth, you know, about 300, 3 billion, 3 and a half billion, some geologists are going to correct me, I know, but in, in that sort of uh, range. And they have this wonderful layered look because they've been thrust back into the earth over and over and over again. The stones themselves have been there about, uh, as I remember, 5,000 uh, years standing there. When they were discovered, they were only sticking up about this much above the ground, the tallest ones, because the peat had grown up all around, uh, over the centuries over that. And so uh, no one really realized it was a complete circle until the peat was dug away. This is the island of Staffa. Uh, off of Iona there uh, in, uh, on the west coast. It's a great uh, example of basalt columns and, uh, and the forms of it. Uh, this shot from a zodiac uh, out there, about six frames, uh, very quickly going uh, as the zodiac bounces around and then uh, stitched together. But the island of Fingal's, or, I mean, sorry, the cave, Fingal's Cave is there in that black area to the right. And this is a shot at about four in the morning. Um, it's about a three minute exposure. The, uh, the, the, the blue is coming from a very pre-dawn light uh, that's very blue outside. And then I have two guys from the uh, Argyle Hotel uh, back there with flashlights in the back of the cave lighting up the interior of the cave because all of, virtually all of the images of Fingal's cave you ever see is just recedes into blackness and you have no idea what's back there. You know, so I wanted something that brought the, the inner workings of the place to life. And then, you know, sort of these grand spectacles. This was Bore, this island, this is great fang of a rock out there, uh, 50 miles west of the Outer Hebrides. Went out there, took a boat out in the evening, uh, cost about $2,500 to get there. Uh, just to rent the boat for the night to go out there. We had 15 minutes of light when we got there. We went around the island. When we came around, a good 10,000 gannets came out flying out uh, to meet us. And I was a very happy camper as I, as I clung to the rail of the back of the boat. Uh, a guy was holding onto my belt to keep me from flying off as the thing was pitching around wildly. But 
the birds made uh, the pictures. So we did another story on soil. And this is really an, an appreciation. This is really meant to be uh, about how soil uh, is part of our life and part of our world. So I was looking for lush things where soil was really important. I went up to Wisconsin to do that. Uh, looking at how since World War II, the expansion of use of energy in soil uh, has meant that fewer and fewer people can farm larger and larger areas. But we had other things to get at in that story. For instance, roots and how it is that, that soil works. So we had some pictures here of Jerry Glover from the Land Institute. Uh, uh, we've got one of their images right out here of, um, of some of their roots there. And we'd done that, you know, a multi-section picture of roots that, of a plant that's about 14 feet long altogether. Even though seeing it this size, you have to have the scale, of course. And so it's, when I do these presentations, it's when I do this that it comes to life. And I start telling people about uh, the plants, their iceberg nature of most of it existing below the uh, surface, that they started there four feet above the ground, and now we are down almost to ground level. And now we are a foot below the surface in the midst of the root ball going down there, two feet below the surface, three feet below the surface. To lay audiences, this is very powerful. They all of a sudden get a sense of how big and complex these beings are. We're about six feet below the surface now, seven, maybe eight feet about here, because when we get down to the very tip, we're gonna be nine feet uh, below the surface of the prairie. Those kinds of images and the, and and the way they are presented turn out to be, of course, very powerful. I spend time chasing earthworms around petri dishes and lighting them from below so they'll look like arteries in the earth, and I was ecstatic when I found a guy at the University of Iowa had a great collection of soil fungi for me to photograph. But I also wanted to do farmers. And I wanted to do farmers connected with their soil. So I did a series of about 12 soil pits around the world on this story, looking at farmer and their soil. So here's James Duggan out in Kansas with Virgin Prairie. Cletus Reed and his son up in Iowa there where they have really rich topsoil. Pedro Macedo down in Brazil with uh, terra preta, that black earth that was created. Farad Kalawi in Syria, you notice that we're getting into soils that are very different in character. But each time you connect the culture, the people, and the soil, it says something to you. Hassoun Harari, Harari in uh, Syria who said we, we farm by the will of Allah and with rocky soil like that, I absolutely believe it. On to the Los Plateau in China, Xiao Qing Fang, uh, with that very deep soil. And finally, Mariama Abdule in Niger, trying to raise food for her children on soil like that. That piece in that story was perhaps the mo one of the most effective things we did, connecting people and the, and the soil and showing those connections. But we also wanted to show dying soils, so we did some things like this, you know, looking at a place that in the Byzantine era had been a lush agricultural area and had lost since then a good three to four feet of topsoil. Or what the Chinese were doing out in uh, Shanxi province, you know, trying to reforest places that had been extraordinarily eroded. A woman in that area who was crying because her eight or nine children had all moved away because they couldn't make a living farming there anymore. So all of these, these things tied into that. Girls hauling firewood, young women hauling firewood, 10 kilometers each way each day uh, in Niger. And, but then also this sort of hopeful things. This is an area of Burkina Faso that was hard hit during the famine of the 80s um, and the drought. This was a picture they took when they went out during the middle of that drought to try and start planting trees. And this is the same spot where they stood and the 20, 25 years later, the trees that have grown there. So every time somebody starts to tell you that Africa is hopeless, uh, I hope you'll remember something like that image. Certainly I was impressed with it when uh, I sat down with Jacob Saudogu in his house and all these women started coming in and uh, there was all his grain, all his millet inside his house there and all these women, I asked who they were and they were his three wives, their daughters and daughters-in-law 
and grandchildren. So Jacobo is a rich guy. He is a great, he looks like Morgan Freeman, but he's a, rich, he's a rich guy. Light pollution was a story I went specifically after because of my interest in astronomy. And there again, we needed to have a picture that really told people what they have lost. What is the richness that is, we, we have? So I went out to Natural Bridges National Monument uh, in Utah and found the Milky Way on a glorious night. And then I've got a guy with a flashlight down below that arch lighting it up. Then we wanted to show the contrasting effect. So I went flying over Chicago to see the ways that modern cities project huge amounts of light uh, up into the sky. Here's another example. I found this photograph from Mount Wilson that a guy had gone up there and taken in 1908. I was able to find almost the same location a century later and see the amount of light. Going on. These things are terribly effective with readers. But this was too, almost an abstract image of the St. Louis Arch on an evening when low clouds were getting the city lights reflected up there and the spotlights were casting shadows from the arch onto the low-lying clouds. Some of them I went very specifically looking for things like this. Mount Wilson, you know, the, cyan the astronomer up there, you know, with the lights of the city down below and what a problem that is to him. But I also found a dark sky housing development in Arizona in which every house has a, uh, a dome with a telescope on the roof and there are strict, strict regulations on what kind of lighting you can have uh, and all this. And as a consequence, you go out in the, uh, at night and the Milky Way is a glorious thing. So the research in this is, is voluminous, trying to find things. For instance, these are birds that were killed by running into skyscrapers in Toronto over one winter. And these were uh, turtles trying to come back to where they were hatched to lay their eggs on Juneau Beach uh, in Florida amidst all these rising skyscrapers and shoreline development. The tall grass prairie was a similar kind of story in which we were trying to bring to people there an understanding of of what a glorious thing the Flint Hills of Kansas really were. So I went looking for this glorious evening image to tell that exactly that kind of thing. But I also wanted to go through the seasons, and the seasons there involve fire, the burning off of the, of the grasses, the subsequent return of that lushness. I, I always am delighted when people come into our gallery and ask which part of Ireland this is, you know, and I'm able to tell it's my home state of Kansas. The intricate relationship of the plants and the insects and the animals and all that. The glorious nature of the storms that thunder through. And then out there with the fireflies in the evening on a, uh, on a still evening as the storm was approaching. All of those things were very important to this story to try and, and bring our readership into the understanding that there was something really here. And finally, the story I'm working on right now. This is a story about 10,000 years of our food. Basically, if I say what the story is, it is about the, the preservation of biodiversity in domesticated crops and livestock. Now, there's a one to put the yawn in your, in your throat, you know. Um, but when you really get down to it, it's fascinating stuff. There were seed savers, all those, those uh, wonderful plants and everything that they grow up there in Decorah, Iowa guys growing wheat varieties in Ethiopia that I photographed a couple of weeks ago and seeing scenes like this of them growing local varieties of oats that are adapted to those specific areas of Ethiopia, to people who are vitally dependent upon uh, livestock for labor in a way we can't imagine here in the United States anymore. The kind of relationships that they develop with the animals that are part of their lives, something that's been part of our human history and emotional development for 10,000 years. Off to Peru to photograph uh, potatoes where they grow 1,300 varieties of potatoes. Here we are at about 14,000 feet up in the Andes. Those are potato fields in the Andes. This is where you, where you do that. And then coming back down uh, where they have all these potatoes, they eat about, I asked how many potatoes they eat, six to 10 pounds of potatoes per person per day. Yeah, there's a number for you. About the same number that people in Ireland ate before the potato famine struck. 
And that was why the potato famine was so desperately awful. This is the famine memorial in Dublin to the potato famine. So part of this story, obviously, I had to go up to Svalbard and see the seed bank up there that Kerry Fowler and, uh, and uh, all those good folks have developed as a backup for all the seed banks around the world. But also to places like the USDA seed bank there in Ames, Iowa. Anybody from Iowa here? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, and to see how they do it. You know, you have to grow out those plants every, every few years in order to keep the seeds viable. On up to uh, Seed Savers in Decorah, where, uh, you know, they were having their annual tomato tasting, 47 varieties of tomatoes. So here is all I'm saying is I'm, I'm taking a story with a very obtuse, arcane sounding title and trying to bring it to life. Here is a uh, seed bank in Ethiopia, rather different. And here is a farmer who has his own seed bank. He went through the famine in 1984, and when he did that, and he lost people from his family, he changed his farming, and now he keeps his own seed bank in his house. So this is the, re the real world, and, and all of these things are not just heirloom tomatoes. People really depend on these things. These are Shaco cattle. There are only about 2,500 of them left in the world. Uh, they are particularly... Uh, adapted to environments where the tsetse fly is intensive. And so, but each, in each case, I don't want to just show the cow, I want to show the relationship. I want to show what it means to people. These are black Welsh, Welsh black cattle up in Wales, up in Snowdonia. They are kind of bred to be a little protective of their, out there in those remote areas. These are Charlays there. I believe they're Charlays there at the Royal Welch Show. I kind of like the way the cattle and the guys kind of have this little relationship going on there, you know. We've developed this over 10,000 years of our life on Earth. Here are the judges at the Royal Welch Show, you know. Generations, thousands of years of people looking at the curves of a horse's uh, back, uh, of how wide the feet are set on a cow, of what kind of wool uh, a lamb uh, grows of how long a Welsh white hog should be so that they can, they can nurse the maximum number of piglets. They are, long, they are bred to be long so that they can nurse a lot of piglets. I actually kind of like this picture though. You see, I kind of like see the angle of the guy's foot and the angle of the pig's foot, you know. I kind of like that, a little business in here. It's a subtle thing, you know, Does, but it's, a, it's great fun. Up to see hill radners who are, born, who are bred for that particular place in Wales, and if we lose them, we lose all those generations of people paying attention to this kind of stuff, you know. Carry Hill sheep, man, they're, they're bred for lawns. I swear, they get the cushiest life in the world. Unlike, say, the North Ronaldsay sheep who are bred to eat only seaweed. There is a fence around the island that keeps them out on the shore so that they will eat only seaweed. I mentioned teff. Teff is uh, that grain that they grow in Ethiopia. So I followed the line of that. I went to the markets where the women were selling teff, to that woman mixing the teff there in Ethiopia, and, and then cooking the injera with it. All of them just the, the intentional way of making a narrative out of this, of following when I saw these uh, women with the, carrying the sorghum home in the evening, and the child who was learning at like three years old that this is how you live in a place like this. Boys eating the same sorghum that the cattle were eating. I mean, it's the cattle, the sorghum, the lifestyle, all of it is intertwined and we monkey with those things uh, at our peril. Finally, what we did was go out and look for ways of showing this variety. So I went and photographed all these strange varieties of chickens at uh, Tatton Park there in England. Really weird ones, you know. Potatoes. These are potatoes from Peru, things we've hardly ever seen. All of them have names, all of them have stories associated. This is uh, from Q Millennium Seed Bank in, uh, outside of London. This is Kapok. Remember Kapok uh, Ves? That's Kapok. You know, that's where, that's where, you, where you get it. These seeds are used for mouse traps in Madagascar. Uh, the architecture of the seeds, of course, has its own, its own beauty. And then there's the great story of corn, which started out as uh, Teosinti, if I have this right, you know and then has evolved into the corn uh, that we know today, including this kind of corn, which has a husk on each kernel. I mean, there's this, the, the variety of things out there is absolutely stunning. 
Not going to use the rabbits because we couldn't get enough variety, but I like this rabbit. I like the way he stuck his tongue out for me, and so I wanted to show it to you too. So there you go. Thank you very much. All right.